Welcome to this afternoon's uh, web webinar. My name is Ken Gibb. I'm the director of the UK Collaborative Centre for Housing Evidence, and I'm joined by my colleague Gareth James, who is our Knowledge Exchange Associate for Scotland. And uh, the pair of us are going to hopefully provide an interesting introduction to CASH, uh, as we call the Collaborative Centre. And uh, we plan to talk to you uh, as a kind of joint uh, offering for the next 20 minutes or 25 minutes before we'll take uh, questions and answers. So I hope that this will be an interesting uh, talk. So we're going to start by just saying a little bit about what, the, what we want to cover in the webinar today. And I think first of all, what I'd like to do is introduce Cash to people who don't know much about us, including uh, academics working in research centres and similar fields, or those who are just interested in what I hope turns out to be an interesting different working model when you compare us to other more conventional research centres. It's also a chance for us to share not just how we work, but some of the things that we're actually doing and how, how we do them. And we want to also talk a little bit about some of our, uh, what we think are exciting plans for 2020. So we'll get on with it now and there'll be plenty of opportunity for you to uh, post questions at the end, which we will try and answer as fully as we, as we can. So who are we? What is CASH? CASH is a five-year programme funded by the ESRC, the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the Joseph Rentree Foundation. We're really about trying to make as rigorous an evidence case for housing so that it can inform policy and become embedded in practice as is possible. We are a, a wide ranging consortium. We cover the whole of the UK and we are, have developed a, a fairly significant network of academics and partners working across the kind of hub and spoke model. Although we're all over the UK, as I'll talk a little bit further in a second, uh, our main Locations are Glasgow and Sheffield, where most of our staff, and most of our co-investigators are based. But we do have a presence in every part of the, of the UK. The, the centre is organised around seven substantive themes and also by five geographical knowledge exchange hubs. Now, these are partnerships with uh, between cash and groups of experts in five different parts of the UK. Uh, Gareth is going to talk much more about what they're there to do, what they've done so far, and what we hope to do with them in the future. Uh, it's maybe a nerdy thing to say, but uh, people who are interested in research centres are often interested in how they're governed. So I'll just say a few words about that. At an internal level, we have a, a management team of uh, five of us who meet regularly to discuss our strategy and, and key operational issues. We uh, have a, we are, I suppose, a virtual centre in that, in that we have to communicate often on the phone or by Skype, but that seems to so far have worked very well. I think in large part that's because of the actual staffing arrangements we have with our knowledge exchange staff, which I, as I say, we're going to talk more about as the webinar proceeds. From an external governance point of view, as you would expect, we have a funding group who we meet with regularly to talk about how we're uh, dispersing our funds and, and making sure that we are doing the things that our strategy and our original uh, funding plan set out. But we also have an international advisory board which meets once a year, which we liaise with on a bilateral basis and a more regular basis. It's chaired by Lord Kerslake, and uh, we've met that, that board has met formally three times now. Um, Another feature of cash, which is very distinctive, I think, is its uh, focus on deliverables and communication and events. So we have a strong social media presence. We're very much governed by our website and its interoperability with social media and the actual deliverables in terms of our, our research outputs. And we do a whole range of events, both virtual like this, in the form of uh, uh, workshops, conferences, roundtables and, and the likes. We're very active in that field. And I think the longer we've gone on, the more we've done these things, the more comfortable we've got with a, probably a broader array of such forms of communication and dissemination than academics are often perhaps comfortable with. But now it's becoming increasingly second nature 
that we have to strive to, to communicate as effectively as we possibly can. Still not struggling to move the sort of sorry, I moved my slides the wrong way. So that's the slide I was trying to get to. So I just wanted to summarize in numeric terms really what exactly we do in the scale of what we do. So we actually have 14 consortium members, that's 11 un universities and three non-academic bodies, all trade bodies, the uh, Royal Institution of Charter Surveyors, the Chartered Institute Housing, the World Town Planning Institute. Our five knowledge exchange hubs cover the four countries of the UK, though we have two uh, in much bigger England. Uh, we have altogether 16 staff members and 29 co-investigators, so that is a big group who we communicate with every week. I'll talk more about that again in a few minutes. Uh, we've been active. We, we were actually start, we started business in August 2017. So we're just coming up to the halfway point of our five-year funding. So far, you'll find more than 50 publications on our website, more than 80 blogs. On our uh, YouTube channel, you'll find more than 25 videos and films and animations. And uh, we think we've held more than 80 events now as well. Uh, we are because we're a big team, because we're operating across these themes, uh, and because we're having several waves of research activity, we've now completed 12 projects. There are no fewer than 20 projects currently underway, and we have at least, I say at least, at least six new projects, uh, which we're looking forward to start shortly. So I thought it would be interesting to say a little bit about what, from our side, appears to be the sort of distinctive features of what, what we do. And again, I'm going to introduce some ideas that Gareth will talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. So first of all, we said from the outset that we would co-produce our priorities. And by that, we mean we really liaise, consult, and listen to and jointly decide priorities with the wider housing community. And we've used the knowledge exchange networks, among other things, to make that happen. And we, we're really committed to that. And we think it's been quite effective part of our work. Secondly, and I've already mentioned how important knowledge exchange and communications are, but actually from a, a line management point of view, they're also very important because what we've been able to do is we've been able to draw a consistency across all of our activities so that we have the same kind of dissemination plan or the same kind of impact plan for every piece of work. And that quickly becomes what are the time scales? What, is the, what, what are the ways in which this project is going to deliver on these things? And because we have a knowledge exchange member of staff involved in every one of our projects, we actually have a, we're effectively a fairly, as it were, low cost way of, involved, of ensuring a degree of consistency in everything that we do. That probably wasn't an explicit intention when we started, but it's definitely a very good way to work. It's also worth saying that we are, uh, evolved in our activities so that some of our projects are located in a certain place. So we might have a project in Bristol run by the Bristol research team, but we might also have projects which spread across the uh, UK. So for instance, we have a three year program on raising standards in the private rented sector, which involves a, an advisory board in Scotland and a research role in Scotland, as well as a, a, a similar advisory board and work program in England. And uh, actually that works very well. We're very interested in drawing lessons, as it were, from different parts of the UK as devolution leads to diversity and divergence in housing policy and practice. So this is a very nice way of trying to make some uh, sense of that and actually share some uh, little lessons as we go along. One of the other things that were very keen when we started in cash was that we felt very strongly that uh, the housing research offer the number of people actively involved in housing research making it a career had been shrinking for some time so we've been very keen to really promote uh, building up of research capacity and clearly we've done quite a lot of that ourselves we have brought in new early career researchers many of our early career uh, research staff are actually our knowledge exchange staff as well we funded many phds already and we're actually running an annual summer school which supports housing phds regardless of whether they're in cash or not. And we're strategic partners with the Housing Studies Association. So all, all of these things are helping to uh, uh, prom pr promote the uh, 
the number of younger people thinking about getting involved in housing research and simply building capacity that will be there after cash is not as, as it were. I've already talked about the range of our uh, del deliverables. Just to give you one illustration of some of the things that we've been able to do, we had a seminar probably uh, a year, nearly a year ago now, or certainly nine months ago, uh, that a uh, quite well-known economist, Ian Mohern, uh, held in London that we, that we organised. And that led to a, quite a contentious uh, research paper about the housing crisis. And rather than simply you know, offer it as a paper in our, in our, in our reports that, 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 we, that we published, we thought it would be a nice idea to get two well-known academics to actually peer review the paper. And we published the peer reviews alongside the uh, report. And that's had a considerable amount of impact and interest by, from, from a range of, of, of people who, because it really directly you know, challenges some, some well-held, strongly held views about the housing market. But I think actually the process is really interesting and, and a really nice way of doing things. I'm very keen to do more of these sorts of publicly peer-reviewed uh, papers, which kind of start a conversation just by what's there on, on, on the website. So if you've not seen it, I strongly recommend you have a look at it. I'd also say that we are, an important function of the work we do is that we, we work with other funders beyond just uh, our core funders. So provided the work fits with our strategic objectives, we will seek out new partnerships, we'll respond reactively to new research opportunities. Of course, the world doesn't stand still. So we've actually been doing a lot of that. And my job as director of CASH is increasingly playing that role, which is very, very uh, interesting. It means that we do work that we didn't necessarily expect we were doing. We're just, we've just, for instance, launched a project about the social and economic impacts of housing in Scotland, uh, in terms of housing associations in particular. A, a broad range of uh, fun, funders and working in partnership with HACT, which is a very interesting uh, 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 chance for us to work with a, another interesting research body. Similarly, last year, we worked on a project with the Resolution Foundation. So a lot of that stuff's really important for our long-term funding sustain, sustainability, but is also a great way to enlarge the experience of running a, a research centre like, like this. I'll work out how to change these pages soon enough. I just wanted to say a little bit about uh, the kind of intellectual agenda. It would be easy for us, I think, to simply generate a, a long list of evidence reviews and try to work specifically with various policy practice, practical questions without really getting into some of the more interesting academic ones. Clearly we're funded by ESRC, we're expected to, to pursue uh, an academic agenda. And I mean, we are a multidisciplinary plural uh, group as the third point there makes out, but actually we have lots to say about lots of things uh, and lots of contemporary debates. I only want to pick up on a couple of these, but there's many we could, we could talk, talk, talk about. Uh, first of all, we've been doing some interesting work, I think, on the questions to whether housing is a wicked problem. And that's really about what are wicked problems and the sort of multiple dimensions that they have, the, the causal complexity, the technical administrative complexity, the problems of diversity of views amongst, amongst multiple stakeholders, and trying to think through to what extent housing and, and key housing issues are really at the forefront of that. Secondly, we've been doing a lot of work on housing as a system and thinking about complexity from a complexity science point of view and from causal loop diagram methodologies, things of that kind. And actually, when we put our bid together, that was actually a feature of the bid. We wanted to view housing as a system to get us away from a more partial equilibrium, you know, uh, holding everything else in a constant or a vacuum and not looking at system-wide knock-on effects, etc. So we're very interested in pursuing that and there is a working paper on our publications website about that. And the third point is more methodological. We have committed from the outset to be plural in our approaches. We reflect economists, mainstream and heterodox. We reflect sociologists, uh, people with a whole range of uh, planning and ge geographic backgrounds, which of course cover a multitude of approaches and perspectives. And we want to give them not free reign, but we want them to have the opportunity to pursue their agendas and to look at their perspectives and let their perspectives shine, as, as it were, but to do that in a tolerant and dialogical way, which allows that range of uh, discussion to take place. As I always say, only half jokingly, 
uh, that means that uh, economists get to actually do some economics and not be shouted down, as, as, as it were. So I'm just about finished my part of the talk. I just wanted to finish what I had to say by saying a little bit about where we are at the beginning of 2020 and look ahead a little bit. Three or four things. Again, I could mention many things, but I thought I would mention some of the things that I know a bit about, which, which, is, which is easier for me to do. But uh, we're starting a work programme of a number of projects, the, the Housing Association Impact Study, I mentioned there was one of them, which is a cluster of projects around questions to do with economic appraisal and evaluation of housing interventions. How strongly made and how effective are the economic arguments that civil servants and government do things like the Good Book and the Magenta Book? How good are they at, at actually uh, assessing the impact that housing interventions can have? What can we learn from notions of monetizing well-being, about prevention, things of that kind? Whole range of projects, both about specific interventions, but also about these more methodological uh, issues to do with the treasury and tre tre treasury rules. Secondly, I think we all think it's very important that we engage regularly with Parliament, both Parliaments at the devolved level and at the UK level, and we're delighted to be the research end of an all-party parliamentary group inquiry in social housing and employment. That's just beginning. Third, uh, we've been doing a range of projects in Northern Ireland, which uh, has been through the auspices of the Department for Communities. They have provided funding on an annual basis for the last two, two years to allow us to do a range of work, which includes things like a PhD in homelessness, but also to allow for a pilot which uses the methodology used in Scotland for housing needs and demand assessment to be applied in Northern Ireland. It's actually a tool which the Welsh Government are also uh, uh, developing. We continue to do evidence reviews and uh, two which I might mention are an international review of high-rise housing as a sustainable form of urban intensification which speaks to things like uh, densification to help with uh, uh, inclusive growth and things like that. But we're also doing a study right now of uh, a sort of international evidence review of the effectiveness of rent controls and we're very interested in how that might pan out. So I said an awful lot, it's been quite a wide tour of the horizon. I'm now going to pass over to Gareth, who is going to talk much more specifically about not knowledge <coughs> exchange. Gareth. Okay, thanks, Ken. Um, as Ken said, I'm Gareth, uh, Gareth James, and I'm a knowledge exchange associate uh, at CASH. I'm one of five uh, knowledge exchange staff, and uh, broadly speaking, I'm responsible for um, coordinating our knowledge exchange efforts in Scotland, um, and my counterparts elsewhere um, do the same um, for Wales, for Northern Ireland, and for the north of England and, um, and the south. Uh, but we also work together as a team um, with our communications and engagement officer to um, uh, uh, pull our efforts in, uh, across the UK and keep each other updated and informed on, on what we do. So I'm going to go, Ken's mentioned uh, some of the things we do in relation to knowledge exchange already. I'm going to go into a bit more detail about our knowledge exchange hubs, um, what, they, what they are, what the, their role and purpose is, and some of the things that we've done uh, with those hubs um, over the past uh, couple of years. And I'll also say a bit more about our, um, our approach to uh, impact more generally as well. So our knowledge exchange hubs, we have five, five uh, hubs across the UK. Uh, as I said, one in Scotland, one in Wales, one in Northern Ireland, uh, and two uh, in England. And each of these hubs brings together up to uh, 30 um, key stakeholders from across the housing system in each of those different um, uh, nations or, 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 or regions. Um, and this includes people from uh, government, it includes independent researchers, housing associations, private sector interests, third sector, uh, and others, um, including uh, finance and, and, uh, and others, all parts of the, the housing system. So our aim when we were putting these um, groups together was to put together a group that was broadly representative, that when, when they came together, spoke um, for the housing system um, more broadly. Um, on the, uh, on the uh, slides just now, you can see an outline of the, the roles and the purpose um, of these knowledge exchange hubs. And the primary role, the primary reason for um, uh, setting them up 
was to help support us in what we called a prioritization process. This was a way of helping us to identify which themes and projects and topics that we should be focusing on in the first one to two years of, of, of cash, at least in the first instance. So that we weren't just coming up with these things ourselves, but we were actively working with our partners across the sector to identify the things that were more important um, and more meaningful. And by doing that, also then, you know, uh, increasing the likelihood that the work that we are producing is picked up by people working in policy and working in practice. Uh, because as Ken said, our uh, overarching objective is to embed better, more robust evidence um, in policy and, and practice to help improve, improve that across the UK. So our hubs uh, helped us to, to identify those priorities, but they also have these other objectives. Um, they help us to co-produce and jointly deliver events. So for example, we've had a number of events here in Scotland, um, which I can, I can speak more um, uh, to more of the detail on those things. Um, but we've, had, we've done uh, joint work around alternative housing tenures, for example, and the role of those alternative tenures in helping to meet housing demand um, in Scotland. And we've done other things around short-term lets and things that are really important more, more locally um, as well. We've also worked with our knowledge exchange hubs to sort of test and refine and sense check the projects that we've, we've um, been working on over the, the, the past couple of years. And they also help us in terms of um, disseminating the work that we, we do as well. So just coming back again to the, the prioritization process that I mentioned, the, the way in which we went about doing that was to hold a, a, an, an intensive um, facilitated workshop with each of our knowledge exchange hubs um, across the UK. And we did a bit, and we went through a very similar process with residence voice uh, groups, residence focus groups, again across across the UK. And we asked them to identify, first of all, the most important issues um, in housing in, the, in these different uh, regions and nations, um, and then to go through a process of prioritising them. We pulled all that information together and applied some criteria, um, some assessment, you know, some assessment criteria to that, um, just to make sure that what was coming out the other end helped us also to meet our um, overall objectives. And these were the results here. Um, so you can see the, the top ten um, include things like housing affordability, increasing housing supply, uh, homelessness, all very high level um, uh, uh, topics here. And what we then did was continue to have conversations with our partners to work with our co-investigators across the UK to design projects that would speak to some of these issues and answer some of the questions that hub members were asking us around housing affordability. For example, people wanted to know what it means and how we measure it. And we did some work very early on um, with Jeff Mean at the University of Reading answering those questions on increasing housing supply, for example, people wanted to know what factors were, um, what factors affected housing supply, but also um, wanted to know more about um, not just how do we increase the numbers, but how do we um, meet specific uh, needs um, in, in supply, uh, in, in supplying housing. Um, so yeah, I think we can come back to some detail on some of the other projects uh, that we're doing under these, these different different headings here uh, when we get to the questions. So once we've devised these projects, we had to then think of a way of embedding um, impact into the projects, embedding knowledge exchange activities into the projects from the get-go. We came up with this um, impact uh, vision um, plan for each project, and it's, it very much borrows from the Pathways to Impact um, model that uh, the ESRC and others um, use as well. So what we do here is uh, for each project, we go through some of these questions and we, we encourage ourselves and we encourage other members on, on the team to be really clear about what it is that the project is trying to achieve. And one of the ways in which we can, we can do that is challenge ourselves to just say what it's about in one or two sentences but also to um, ask ourselves what it, what it is we want to see change as a result of the work. And that's about knowing what's, um, what's already out there and what's already happening 
and then understanding how our work and our research can help to bring about that change. We also want to ask ourselves who might actually benefit from or help us with the work and we can differentiate here between primary and secondary beneficiaries or maybe a better way of thinking about that is thinking about who your key audiences are and who the, who the influences are, influencers are. Because one of the things that can help us or help our research to get more attention is when other people say that it's, that it's, that it's good, it's important, it's worthwhile looking at. And they might be able to then help us uh, get these messages across to policymakers um, and other, other influencers in policy and practice. We also want to have a clear idea of what people are going to get out of this, but also what we want to um, get from them as well. So it's got to be a two-way two um, partnership. And that leads us to um, answering questions about how we're going to engage with different um, stakeholders and different audiences, because we need to have a, a, a one-size-fits-all approach will not work. We need to sort of tailor how we engage with different audiences um, to suit uh, uh, to suit different uh, different people, but also depending on the level and, and, and the uh, topic of, or, or focus of the, the project. And finally, um, you've got to, we also need to give some thought to um, the resources that we'll need um, in order to, to, to achieve the impact or at least increase the likelihood of achieving impact. And that's, that's a, a point I wanted to emphasize at this stage is that while we can plan for impact, I think it's important to acknowledge that we can't guarantee it. But what we can do by thinking about it at, this, at the early stage of projects and trying to sort of embed that thinking from the get-go rather than leaving it to sort of the end of the project and think, how do we now, what do we now do with this? Um, you know, one of the things we can do is to increase the likelihood of, of achieving impact um, or achieving some kind of change or influence um, as a result of the work. So a key part of that is, um, is, a, is establishing and developing and maintaining relationships with people, uh, both in policy and practice and across the housing system. So here are some examples from different parts of the UK uh, in which we operate, where I think we've done that quite effectively. So on all of our knowledge exchange hubs, for example, we have representation from the uh, national and devolved um, governments. The Scottish government is on our knowledge exchange hub in Scotland. Um, we also run an annual Scottish housing policy conference. And in the first year, the housing minister gave the keynote address. And we focused on, uh, so far, we've looked at the, the relatively recent changes to private renting, uh, private rented tenancies here in Scotland, and the lessons and things that we could learn uh, from, from that. Um, and we also last year looked at um, inclusive growth uh, in Scotland. We've regularly presented um, evidence at the Scottish Government's Evidence and Policy Fortnight, um, and we've produced a number of uh, SPICE briefing papers with the Scottish Parliament Information Centre. And we've established good relationships with a number of organisations, um, Homes for Scotland, the Scottish Federation of Housing Association, and others who are involved in the hub and develop joint projects uh, with them as well. A couple of other things we're starting off with here um, in Scotland, which are in relatively early stages, the Glasgow uh, East End Knowledge Exchange Hub is an opportunity for us to do some of this stuff that we've been doing at national levels and, and do it more locally and see how we can, how we can uh, use evidence to, to um, uh, improve housing and, and people's housing situations more locally um, as well. And another thing um, in Scotland that's in very early stages just now is our Housing in Place Delivery Forum, which is all about trying to foster more upfront collaboration between planners and uh, housing developers, architects and others involved in the whole residential uh, planning and development uh, process to try and challenge ourselves to think about um, not only what we're doing well in that regard, but how we can um, make a, a positive uh, change, how we might work differently together. In Wales, the Welsh Government's on the hub, on the, the hub in Wales as well. There are regular meetings between the Welsh Government uh, Knowledge and Analytics Service and the Housing Regeneration Team, uh, both uh, are on, on the hub uh, as well. And the Welsh Government plays a key part in helping to organise the Welsh uh, Housing Research Conference. Uh, as well. 
And I think there's also a joint project with the Welsh Government looking at the potential for using individualised uh, homelessness uh, data as well. In England, we have uh, the, the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government on the Knowledge Exchange Hub, and there's also a regular meetings in contact with them, DWP and Homes for England as well. Uh, our North England Knowledge Exchange uh, uh, colleague was, uh, has, has developed a partnership with uh, HQN, and we put out a, a quarterly newsletter with our research evidence, which goes straight to practitioners. Um, as well. And in the South, um, our Knowledge Exchange Associate there has worked with the um, affordability, the Affordable Housing Commission, and they've recently developed a, an animation which explains why housing is unaffordable. In Northern Ireland, as also Ken has mentioned, a, a couple of the projects that, that have occurred there, there's an ongoing programme of collaborative work with the Department for Communities in Northern Ireland, and most recently they've done some stakeholder engagement work around issues related to the private rented sector. So as I say, relationships, partnerships, collaboration, really key to, uh, it's a key part of knowledge exchange, but it's a key part of helping us to achieve the impact that we, we, we aim to achieve. Uh, and these are just some examples of the way in which we've, we've gone about doing that. I think that's it for me. Okay, great. So I think that's us essentially giving you the, 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 the formal part of the presentation we wanted to do. I think we've covered a huge amount of ground, so I hope there'll be a lot of interesting questions that we'll do our best to answer. I think we might, first of all, turn off the uh, presentation and minimise it if we can. Yep. Great. Okay. Hi there. So I'm just uh, coming in now. Uh, my name is Sasha and I'm an intern for CASH uh, for the communication engagement team and I would like to invite you now to type a question or a comment in the chat box so you can find the chat box if you move your mouse over the screen you can see the chat button um, underneath the screen and if you type a question there I can ask it to the presenters um, so feel free to ask anything So maybe just to get started, um, you mentioned Gareth earlier when you showed an overview of the different um, topics with the little boxes, uh, that you could maybe give an example of uh, a project that relates to one of those topics. Mm, can you tell us a bit how, what sort of happened when you had a topic and you were planning impact and what actually happened with the project you designed? Yeah, so I think one of the um, one of the uh, best examples of this is a, um, a a project that we did on land supply markets and uh, land supply systems and how they affect the business of UK speculative house builders. So the, this was one of the projects where we um, uh, we were interested in. Um, uh, looking a bit more about how, well, as I say, how land supply systems affect affect basically the supply of new residential um, housing, and it's one of the earliest examples of us really starting to think about impact right at the beginning, um, and 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 I think that was that was the um, key to the success of the engagements that we we then sort of planned further down. Down, down the route. So by thinking about that earlier on, we were able to identify Homes for Scotland, for example, as a key uh, partner in that work, as well as the Home Builders Federation in London. Um, that led to a number of opportunities, speaking opportunities at the Homes for Scotland uh, conference, where we presented um, the outline uh, or our sort of proposal for the work and some early findings. And um, we were able to get some feedback and comment and sort of had a steer from the audience as well on evidence that we might have missed, for example. Um, it also led to opportunities for roundtables with the executive boards of both Homes for Scotland and the Home Builders um, Federation, which again was a really great way of sense checking what we had done up to that point um, and, and making sure we hadn't, hadn't missed anything. But also a really useful opportunity to share with them the evidence that we were finding from academic um, literature publications. And one other thing I would say that that's sort of illustrates, I think, the success off the back of that project is the ongoing work that we've been doing with Homes for Scotland. 
Um, we have a joint project with them looking at, you know, understanding development, residential development pathways uh, through the planning system in Scotland, uh, specifically post uh, global financial crisis. Um, and that project's currently underway uh, just now, I think if I'm right in saying, there was a lot of work done on that, a lot of academic research done on that topic in the 70s and 80s, maybe the 90s, but there's not been a lot done over the past 10, 20 years. So we're, we're really sort of revisiting um, some of that with them as well. And I don't know if that would have happened had we not had that earlier engagement with them through the project as well. And they've also been a really valuable um, partner in um, uh, starting up the Housing in Place Delivery Forum that I mentioned. And also putting us in touch with house builders for various different things, whether it be advisory groups or um, interviews for uh, projects like the one we're doing just now on, on, on delivering design value, for example. So that's just one um, example. And we've managed to do that with others, not just Homes for Scotland, but it's, really, it's just a really good uh, example, I think. Great, thank you. Uh, so I have some questions uh, coming in. So first of all, um, Chris is asking, how can practitioners get involved in the work of cash? So if a practitioner is interested in a project or, um, yeah, who could they contact? I suppose there's a number of ways that people will, will hear about us. There's, uh, they may just see us in social media or they may see us in some kind of uh, event or activity that, that we're at. The simplest way is to contact us through our website. Uh, we have there's a con contact form there that people can get in touch with, with us. They can quickly become, uh, through Twitter, they can quickly become uh, uh, part of a network which will receive a, a, a tweet or, or an email sorry, every week. And, and uh, that, in that way, they'll get a sense of our, of our, of our active work. If they, if they want to be involved in specific projects, contact us di di directly. We, we have... We certainly, we certainly very open to people just coming directly to us and, and contact us. And I regularly get people, I'm sure Gareth as well, gets people who, who cold call us in one, one way or another. And that's, that's, of course, that's uh, 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 absolutely fine. So some of our most interesting uh, uh, developments over the last couple of years have started on that sort of basis. So there's some benefit to us. Don't think, think, think there isn't. I'm sure, I'm sure there often is. And uh, we're, 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 we're very happy to talk to people about our work. Great, thank you. Uh, another question from Claire is to say that it would be good to hear more about the more formal strategic partnerships that Cash has formed over the last two years uh, mm -hmm. and values that Cash has found in these and what Cash can offer partners. Well, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of them. In one, mm -hmm. I mentioned briefly the Housing Studies Association. So we have been involved, they have an annual lecture which usually runs in the autumn and we've co-supported that. We've been directly involved in that for the last three years years. We uh, participate actively in their annual conference and we support uh, uh, various events around, around the conference. We usually run a workshop stream and we, we chair at least one, one session and we just generally want to support the very important activities of the Housing Studies Association and I think we have a good relationship with them and long, long may it can continue. Uh, another partner which is I think very interesting because I have a personal involvement in it is the Centre for Homelessness Impact. Uh, which is run out of London, but is also uh, very prominent in Scotland. So we are partners of, of them and they are partners of us in the sense that I'm, on, I'm a trustee and I'm on their, their board, but uh, Ligia, who, who runs the Central Homes Impact, is on our advisory board and we are, we're actively uh, looking at ways in which we can work uh, together. And we have lots of people in common as well. And they are very interested because they're a hot work centre. They're a form, formerly a hot work centre, so they have a, a really rigorous and interesting approach to evidence and analysis. And I think we have a lot to learn from that in exactly the same way that I hope they have things to learn from, from us too. Great, thank you. Um, another question is about, um, have any of your projects so far involved aspects of co-design or community research with residents? Yes, we're talking about the Yeah. Um, so one of the things we, we're um, uh, working on at the moment, trying to establish uh, more, more formally, is the Glasgow East End Knowledge Exchange Hub. Um, and as I said, this is um, based on the same model as our national level hubs, but uh, much more locally uh, rooted in the, East End, uh, in the East End of Glasgow. 
And it brings together not only local organizations with an interest in, in housing and housing related issues, um, but also um, local residents and tenants um, who, who have uh, signed up to take part as well. So we, through that um, hub, we have worked to um, uh, develop a program of work with, with uh, and for the local community. Um, we, we, um, we, we went through a very similar um, process to a national level prioritization uh, work where we asked people locally what issues were, were most important to them. And there were three in particular that came out on top. Um, one was around, one was mental health. Uh, another was around loneliness and isolation. And a third was about safety, both within the home and within the immediate community. There was a lot of talk during that um, initial uh, workshop that we had with them about poverty as well in general, um, as a driver of all of these things. Um, so we started to, we've started looking at, um, in particular, mental health, um, because there are clear connections there between mental health, loneliness, isolation, uh, feelings of safety or unsafety, um, and how this relates to people's housing situation. One of the things that we then did with, um, uh, or we did together in partnership with members of that hub, was to produce a short film about the East End. Uh, of Glasgow, and we're just asking people uh, to tell us a bit more about, first of all, what they what they love most about living in the East End of Glasgow, um, so that you know we're also you know the East End of Glasgow tends to get a bit of a, a bad rep at times, um, but there's a lot of good things going on as well, and there's an opportunity there working with people to tell a bit of a, a positive narrative. We were also interested um, to hear from them what they you know, what home meant to them, um, and uh, in particular, what makes for a good housing situation, what makes a home for someone who has, uh, is experiencing or has recent experience of mental ill health. And we also, you know, the reason for that then is that we can begin to learn some lessons about how we, for example, design housing or how housing associations engage and, and cater for the needs of people with experience of mental ill health. So we've also been talking to local housing providers about the things that they do to help people uh, in general and also, as I say, people with mental ill health to turn a tenancy into a home. What kinds of support services do they offer, for example, and what lessons could we learn um, from that? So that work is ongoing um, and I expect uh, you'll see some more, um, more on that in the, in the coming months. Excellent, thank you. Um, a question from Jenny Hislop. She's writing, you have a lot of publications for the number of completed projects. And so I wondered if you could tell us more about the scope and size of the projects you undertake, given the collaborative nature of your work, and um, whether you have a lot of additional publications beyond mm -hmm. academic literature to deliver, because housing is so much a political priority as well. Yeah, we, we, we published probably four or five different types of things, uh, which we've included in that list. So there are a, a number of evidence reviews, which work to a common template, normally international evidence reviews, where we have a framework for doing a rather uh, quick and we hope efficient and still you know, robust uh, evidence review. It's not systematic evidence review in that sense, but it provides a lot of detailed evidence using digital, digital searches of databases and follow-up, et cetera. So that's a major plank of what we do. But we've also published a number of research reports. Sometimes the work that we're interested in doesn't really lend itself to an evidence review, or we know enough about the evidence already. So there might be some primary research, or there might be a combination of different things, or we're doing some work for a third party, and they have some specific requests. So I mentioned briefly, we did some work with the Resolution Foundation last year, it's about housing wealth inequality, which produced an evidence review, but also a report, a summary report. So there's a number of things, and the Resolution Foundation published a report as well. So a number of things come out of that. We've also got some uh, working papers. Uh, we've got some uh, kind of position pieces. We've got some policy briefings. We're now moving into planning to do some practice briefings. One, uh, one of our colleagues in the Scottish housing system came to us recently and said that there were some core ideas in housing which are often badly or ill-explained for the layperson. So we are going to, going to rather courageously try to explain those concepts 
And the first one we're going to do is on affordability, actually. Uh, so we're, we're hoping to write some what we call practice briefs, which are essentially for the non-housing professional. We hope that we have interest in housing professionals as well, which try to try to unpack what some of these ideas which we use in a throwaway casual sense what they what they really mean so again these briefing papers will be important as well and i think amongst our publications as well i think if you look through it you'll see there's some academic journal articles as well which are the distillation of some of those reports which are open access or whatever we put them on the, the website as well so there are a lot of things there we also we also invite other people to to write for us and i mentioned Ian Mulhern earlier and we certainly want to be a site for people to engage in housing policy debates, to share how, how, how housing evidence, we, 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 we welcome that. And similar with our blogging, we have a, a, a wide range of external people that blog for us as well as colleagues within CASH too. If I could just add to that, some of our evidence reviews, especially those that we did in the first uh, year and a bit, um, have then sort of led on to yes. more empirical uh, primary uh, research. So we've maybe done some evidence, uh, an evidence review, which has been sort of ground clearing exercise, and we've built on that um, by doing some primary primary work as well. Thank you. Uh, so Ken, you talked about how cash has been responsive to current needs. Uh, could you share a bit more information about work that cash has done to inform particular groups? So, for example, tailored workshops for local government. Yeah, well, we've done, we've done, I mean, all, these things are, uh, are, are, are very wide ranging. So to give you one example, Gareth and I went to a local authority in Scotland and basically did an introduction about housing policy and evidence for them, which turned into half a day uh, of, and, and, as, and not only that, but we've had a, a, a subsequent engagement with them ever since. I've also had the opportunity to do some work with COSLA in Scotland. Uh, talking about what to do with property taxation and, and issues uh, uh, around around that, but we I think we've had we've had a lot of, uh, of these sorts of, uh, uh, of opportunities which are genuinely reactive things. But we, as I said earlier, we we do we are involved in a lot of conversations with uh, a whole range of housing stakeholders. Uh, we haven't really talked about parliamentarians today. I mentioned the or party parliamentary group, but we've good relationships with various parts of the Scottish Parliament, for instance, because Gareth and I are in Scotland, and uh, we've done a, a number of things. We've contributed to political parties' research com com commissions on housing. We have uh, contributed to work that Scottish Parliament Information Centre do, but we've also, for instance, been at the strategic day for the local government parliamentary com committee. So that's an opportunity to try to uh, <clears throat> shape or inform their uh, agenda. So we've done, we, do, we do a lot of these things. Great. Um, and Natalie Jones asks, uh, have the hubs found any barriers to engaging with local system partners? So what have their reactions been to having a hub in their area? That's a tough one. <clears throat> I think my own view is I think most people who are involved in the hubs see it as an opportunity. It's an opportunity to get together with people in, our, in a small country like Scotland or Wales. I'm sure the same people sit around many discussion working group type arrangements, but the hub gives them an opportunity to create agendas, to raise points, to, to do things which are relevant right now, but are also emerging agendas which are going to be important in the future. And I think the fact that the people generally stay with us yeah. and, the, and the turnover is relatively small, uh, often tunnels caused by people moving jobs rather than losing interest in, in what they might do. That said, we're very aware of the need to maintain the momentum, keep people, keep it fresh, give people real opportunities. So we, we are trying to do that all, all along. But I think there might be one or two. There's always going to be examples of people who don't like a particular thing we're doing or don't like some of the conclusions that are arrived at in a discussion or, or whatever. But surprisingly rare, I would say. Yeah, and where that kind of thing does happen, it's very easy, for example, uh, for us to form a working group or something that branches off from the hub um, to focus on a, a, you know, um, a specific question, whether it be around, as I mentioned earlier, the role of alternative housing tenures or what a vision for the housing system might be. Um, it might be difficult to get 30 people to agree on what a vision for a housing system looks like. But those who want to 
take that conversation further outside of Hub Meteors and do something with it. More than, you know, there's, there's plenty of scope um, for doing that kind of thing as well. If I could bring the last two questions together, uh, we, on a responsive basis, really, colleagues in, in London uh, and in the South, uh, recognised that there was, a, there was an appetite for work to be done to investigate the potential for social housing reform in the light of the social housing green paper in England and also the Grenfell Fire. And uh, that led to uh, a really interesting uh, programme of work we called the Social Housing <coughs> Working Group, which led to half a dozen papers and a really good group of people who came along. To, I only went to one meeting, but I could see that the quality of the conversation, the people they got for the, the meeting, who weren't all part of the hub, but were people who had an interest in social and affordable housing and, and uh, mm. Uh, uh, future. So that, I mean, that, that, that was exactly the model they kind of wanted. It was, a, it was kind of bottom up. It just emerged because of a, a clear and present issue which had, had arisen and it led to a lot of work which are now reported on our, on our web, website. Thank you very much. Uh, Lisa Birchall asks, um, well, she says that the sector is very good at doing pilots, but often doesn't seem to follow them up or share the learning more widely. So is there a role for cash in supporting this sharing of learning? I think that's a very good question and a very opposite one. Uh, it's undoubtedly the case that I mean, one of the, the underlying problem here is probably the long lived nature of housing and the time it takes to go from ideas, recognition of a problem, ideas, inception and, and, and action. And because of the political short term nature of so much of our, our lives, uh, in, in both devolved countries and at UK level, it's often hard to see things through. And it's, it's always great when you see a long-term research programme or housing invest programme or renewal programme which is allowed to actually run the course that it's supposed to do. So you do, as a result, have a whole bunch of pilots and, and ideas that may, might not see it all the way through and don't get the, don't get the exposure and ventilation that, that they ought to get. So I, I completely agree that that's, a, that's an important issue. And I can only say that in a number of the projects that I'm aware of that we've been doing, part of the kind of uh, citing of a topic or, or, or of an issue is that kind of examination of grey literature about reports and evaluations, but also building up a more quality of knowledge of what kind of piloting of specific uh, initiatives have gone on. So this is just a, this is a hypothetical example rather than a, a real world example, but there might be projects like uh, various new forms of affordable housing which you might want to might want to have a, a sense of what's actually happened on the ground so far, what pilots have there been, where does it become embedded, etc. And that might that's a natural part of the on the ground kind of uh, background to the research you're going, going to pursue. So I think it, it's a, it's an important it's an important problem that that, that we have I think, and uh, it's something that, that we're very, very aware of. But it's more, it's also horses for courses. There'll be some topics that we deal with that it's more obviously an important issue than it might be with uh, others. Um, Lisa Borthwick writes, I'm keen to find out more about some of the projects you have planned for this year, particularly the evidence review on rent controls. Are plans published on your website? Yes, well, that project has literally just begun. Uh, so that involves uh, Alex Marsh from the University of Bristol and myself, and also Adriana Sorita, who is based in Glasgow. So we are, we have literally just started. Uh, Adriana is sifting through the academic literature as we speak. And uh, we have a tight timeline around it. So we, we plan to finish the evidence review by the end of March. We will be talking about it at the Housing Studies Association conference in April. Uh, I think, I can't remember immediately what information is on the website about it, but that's, there won't be much more than that. That's kind of where, 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 where we are. We, we are taking an agnostic view about rent controls. We want to see what the evidence says about them. And uh, we think, we know it's a highly relevant pertinent issue. Many, many people have come to us and said, we need more research in this area. We need, we need a, a stronger academic piece of work, but we also need to be relevant and, and of the moment and really get involved with the key issues of housing affordability in the rental market, as well as the, the design issues of how, how, you, how people do design actual rent, rent restrictions in practice. So uh, we were very uh, enthused about that project. And as I say, just, just begun. 
And just to add, one of the things that we, we do sometimes do for projects is we uh, publish a sort of introductory blog. So mm -hmm. I think once the project is sort of fleshed out a bit more yeah. or we're at that stage, you can expect maybe a blog or something to, yes. to give a bit more detail on, on what it is we're going to do um, before the actual results uh, appear on the website as well. Thank you. I think we have time for uh, two more questions that were posed in the chat box. Um, so the first one is by Natalie Jones. She says that you mentioned that you co-decided co the research agenda for cash with the Knowledge Exchange Hubs. Have academics throughout the centre been happy to work this way? I think they certainly have. I mean, we, we designed our original bid and everybody signed up to that bid and that was front and centre. And I should, I mean, it's worth saying just very briefly that the reason why we arrived in that position was partly pragmatic and partly we were kind of inspired, I think it'd be fair to say. I mean, we were, it was pragmatic because the research brief had a huge list of projects that it, what it saw as important to be studied in the, in the housing centre. And it's simply impossible to imagine, even as big a group as we've got, we couldn't get through, through them all. So we needed a, a, a mechanism which we could ration and prioritise. So we wanted to build one which was genuinely relevant and impactful to the housing sector and not just to a bunch of academics. So, you know, that, that seemed like a sensible, pragmatic way of doing it. The inspirational side of it was is that one of our colleagues went to a, a meeting at Harvard in America where they were, you know, in a, in a metaphorical way, they were locked in a room, uh, all these experts on economics, until they came up with a, the, the research question. That, 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 that would unlock a topic and then research would be funded to undertake that. So we like that idea. Can we get these experts for a housing sector within a part of the country to sit down together and actually uh, come up with the key, uh, key priorities and then we take it on from there. And, uh, and our, our academic team has always been excited about that. And I think they, I don't think anybody has demurred from it. They've all been keen to uh, take it on board and, and to rationalize the work, the choices that they've made on the projects on that basis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the final question is from Jamie Irons. Um, and he's asking, are there plans or is there existing work looking at eviction policy? Well, uh, there's, well, there's a number of answers to that, but yes, there are. Uh, the, this raising the standards of the private renting sector project certainly covers issues to do with no-fault evictions. Uh, also, we don't have no-fault evictions in Scotland anymore. Uh, but that's part of the wide tapestry of issues about the regulation of the, re of the rental market. We also had a policy, uh, sorry, a project run out of Sheffield uh, last year, which was about the kind of new exclusion in the housing system. And that was about difficulty of access to home ownership, uh, difficulty of getting secure social tenancies, and also the private sector and, and no fault evictions and issues around that. So. Uh, it kind of fits, fits into that project as well. But, but you know, looking at private renting across the UK, uh, evictions issues are huge. There are, there are also huge issues in social renting as well, although a different set of questions there. Uh, we, I would imagine that we will continue to be looking at ways in which we, we research evictions. Uh, what doesn't go away is such an important issue. It's part of the whole homelessness agenda as well. And just as a, a final point, if you want to keep up to date with work on that, with rent controls and all the other stuff that we're doing, um, do check out the website, housingevidence.ac.uk. Follow us on Twitter at Housing Evidence or sign up and sign up for our, our mailing list as well.